40 cents an hour in 1940. So, of course, that created the slogan, 40 in 40. And when that raise went into effect in, in 1940, 12 million Americans got a raise, 12 million. I, I was always thinking, you know, proportionally, is that like the greatest raise day in the history of the United States, where you have 12 million people all getting a raise on the same day? And for whatever reason, I imagine that everyone's going to the bar and everyone's buying a couple extra rounds or something like that because they are getting something of a significant wage. Now, the, the Fair Labor Standards Act was not just about wages. I mean, there becomes another really critical factor in terms of it. So it's, the, it's kind of the semantic obverse. So we have minimum wage, and the obverse of minimum is, I hope you guys can guess, maximum, and maximum will be applied to the hours. So for the first time in American history, there is a legislated work week. They did not do it by the day. They, uh, for whatever reason, that wasn't the way they wanted to manage this. So they legislate the, minim, the maximum hours would be the 40-hour work week. And so that would allow for flexibility, you know, for people to work four days. The maximum, of course, is, is 40 hours. And I have to tell you that this is a revolution right here. This is the invention of the weekend. You know, all of a sudden, uh, the mass of American workers are going to get Saturday and Sundays off, right, and get to have fun and go camping and, and do a variety of different kind of things. I mean, and it's, a, it's a massive increase in relative leisure time, so big deal. Remember that a lot of people were working 12-hour days. You know, you know, in the, in the worst moments I've ever heard, I've heard of 14, even 16-hour days, and 10-hour days are relatively common. And, and by the way, they, they, could they had to reduce the time, but they couldn't reduce the wage. So that means that, you know, if you'd been working, you know, 50 hours and now you're working 40, you know, you submit, you're actually getting a raise there, right? Even though now you, the, the actual, well, the wage would have to increase, right? Uh, so uh, you, you get a, a benefit there. Now, according to the Fair Labor Standards Act, of course, there was the maximum hours of 40 hours a week. But also according to the Fair Labor Standards Act, you know, you could work more. But if you worked more, you had to be paid a special overtime wage. I've been told that this has been massively abused, of course, in our system. Um, in some cases, the overtime is not recognized, or in other cases, they simply salary you. And, you know, that's the kind of problem for professionals, right? That these guys, you know, lawyers and whoever can work, you know, 80-hour weeks with no, no, no increase in pay whatsoever. But the way it's supposed to work, of course, is that if you, if you do work more than 40 hours, you are supposed to be paid a special like, time and a half overtime wage, which, you know, of course, does work in, in, in a variety of different kind of jobs. So the Fair Labor, oh, and I forgot one more thing, and I didn't do a card for it. The Fair Labor Standards also outlawed the last vestiges of child labor. So minimum wage, maximum hours, and outlawing child labor. When it, the Fair Labor Standards Act came along to outlaw child, child labor, there's not quite as much as there had been, of course, compulsory education laws had diminished the amount of child labor. But there were s certain areas that continued to have uh, some degree of child labor, primarily in the South. And now this is, you know, an outlaw, which really didn't bring about any significant response. By this time, I think most Americans, uh, you know, kind of think it's not a good idea for children to, uh, to be working in factories. So the last thing I'm going to tell you, the last major issue in terms of reform, and it's kind of an interesting reform. It's both reform and relief at the same time. But it was founded in this essential understanding of Franklin Roosevelt and those in the New Deal. They simply thought it was immoral that any American should fall to the level of destitution and be at risk uh, to continue their, their very existence, okay? So I need to kind of clarify, you know, the, the word destitution. Um, there's a word called poverty. I'm sure you guys have heard the word poverty before. And poverty means that you are bereft of resources, you know, and, and of course money and things like that. But you're not so bereft of it that you, that you can't continue to live. In fact, that's the problem, right? You can live in poverty. If you couldn't live in poverty, I would hope we would do something about it. But people can live in poverty. They've lived in poverty forever. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of the tragedy. Because they can live, we allow them to continue in poverty. If they couldn't live, we'd hopefully, you know, we could do something about it. But, so poverty means that you're bereft of resources and you're struggling, of course. But you can live in poverty. But I'm going to use the word destitution to suggest that you are so bereft of resources and support that you will die. I mean, there's nothing for you. You are at risk to die. And Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal generally believed that it was immoral for in a country as wealthy as the United States of America that anyone would fall to the level of destitution and, and put their very life at risk. You know, that, that should not happen. I, I do believe that to be absolutely, they're absolutely correct. You know, how in the world in this wealthy, wealthy country can we allow anyone to die on the streets of this country? I mean, just, there's no reason in the world why that, why that should happen. Okay? So the New Deal sought to rectify this situation. And the essential idea was to create a safety net. Now, let's make sure that we catch these people before they fall. 
fall, or, or as they're falling, we need to catch them on their way down so that they will not fall, fall to the level of destitution, so they will not be at risk to sustain their very existence, essentially. So, um, what the New Deal will do is it will pass what will become one of the most controversial and critical uh, legislative enactments of the New Deal, and it's something called Social Security. So, Social Security, the Social Security Act came along in 1935, and it, of course, is a potential identification. Uh, one of the more important things that was ever done by the um, by the New Deal. The Social Security Act, of course, creates Social Security, and Social Security is indeed a safety net. The concept idea is pretty simple, to make sure that you catch anyone who's you know becoming in, in a very difficult situation, to catch them before they fall. And the way you would catch them, of course, in Social Security was with a series of what were called entitlements. So just by being an American and, you know, by because there is Social Security, that individuals become entitled to our support, and entitled, you know, uh, for us to assist them in whatever we possibly can. And so we see these entitlements beginning to emerge in terms of Social Security. The original and most famous, of course, were old age pensions. So these are people who have become superannuated. Superannuated means that they are, you know, beyond their ability to sustain themselves. And the age that they established, of course, for this was 65. So people over the age of 65, unable to provide for themselves, would be entitled then to Social Security support. Uh, and it ranged from about $10 as the minimum level of support to about $80 as the maximum level of support. Intriguingly, the idea for this, in some ways, came from California. Uh, a doctor, an old dentist by the name of Townsend, had just he'd lost all his money in the, in the crash, you know. And here he is, uh, an elderly person, and, you know, really in trouble. And so he was... He pushed for this notion, you know, there should be some kind of support for those. There are, you know, we, that those people had paid their dues kind of society and that the society needed to, to sustain them. And he came up with an idea that, you know, it doesn't happen, but he wanted, he wanted every single elderly person in America to be paid $200 a month with only one requirement that they, they spend every dime of it. And, of course, he saw that as a way to stimulate the economy, you know, uh, create consumption. But anyway, you know, it didn't quite go that way, of course, but, you know, still, there'd be an entitlement from 10 to $80 depending upon need. Uh, for those that were superannuated. I do want you to know that, you know, at that time only about 2% of Americans were over the age of 65, so it was seen as a, a relatively minimal burden to be placed upon the society, but you know, this was something that uh, old age pensions were something that Social Security would do. Social Security would also be expanded to include disability assistance for those that were disabled or became disabled on the job. They would also be offered an entitlement. Uh, Social Security would also be extended to those that became unemployed, so unemployment insurance. They would be entitled for at least a period of time, of course, for this for support from the Social Security system. And then finally, and you know, very famously, they created something that they called Aid to Mothers with Dependent Children. So if you were a mother and you had kids and you had no visible means of support, then Social Security would be there to provide you. And this, you know, this is the classic expression, what ultimately became known as welfare. So aid to mothers with uh, dependent children. So old age pensions, disability insurance, um, unemployment insurance, uh, aid to mothers with dependent children, they were the, these were the essential parameters of uh, Social Security. Now, as you all know, the question is, continues to be, how do you pay for it? And FDR, at least, you know, he wanted the rich to pay it. So we've been, we're going to call this a soak the, soak the rich tax. The rich people in America, of course, are the chief beneficiaries of America. They gather the massive amounts of wealth, much more than they would need. So, you know, let's, let's make sure that they're the people who are paying for these people that are in significant need. Roosevelt was a very wealthy man. There's no doubt about that. He was of that kind of, you know, we get him periodically, you know, Warren Buffett and others who kind of think, okay, I made all this money. I should kind of do a lot to give back. It's a weird thing because charity in some ways, you know, is, is sustains uh, our, the problems, you know. It, it makes the rich look like they're helping, but it'd be so much better, of course, if we were you know, just redistributing wealth in some other, more kind of elemental way uh, than, you know, having to have to depend upon rich people when they feel sorry for the poor. But anyway, you know, FDR was rich. He thought, okay, we can afford this kind of situation, so let's soak the rich. Now, it's not going to happen like that, of course, because Congress is made up primarily of relatively wealthy people who represent often relatively even more, more wealthy people. And they didn't want to have to have this distribution, redistribution of their wealth to the poor. So instead, the, the legislation will shape Social Security as an insurance program into which the worker and the employer will simply make contributions over the course of, of the worker. In the beginning, it was 1% of their paycheck, so 1% from the worker, 1% contributed by the employer into the Social Security fund, 
with the notion of building up this big fund, of course, that would be there for the individual when they when they needed it, if they re, you know, when they needed the pension. So that the basic idea, and it sustains itself in this way. As you guys know, that you know the problem with Social Security, in many ways, is that it was created for a population that had a very substantial workforce and had very few people that were necessarily in, needing entitlements, especially the elderly. And now we we go to a, a, a demography where our you know, our working age population is less and our elderly population is massive. The, eight, the people in their 80s is like the largest growing cohort in America and the 90s are starting to kind of match that, you know. These people, you know, they're living a long time, of course, you know, on their, on their entitlements, on their benefits from Social Security. And the system wasn't necessarily rigged for that. It was, in the beginning, they were thinking at 2% of the population over the age of 65, and now we're looking at a you know, 20, I don't know what it is, you know, heading towards 30% of the population over 65. So, you know, there's a demographic kind of issue. And, of course, they talk about how the Social Security Fund, especially when the baby boomer mass, you know, really uh, comes on into play, of course, with their retirement, you know, that it will, just, it, it will destroy it. But understand that, you know, these little changes can change everything, right? Uh, little changes in the economic growth can change everything. Increase the withholding to 3%, you know, and right there you change all of the components of the whole thing, and Social Security will continue. Social Security is controversial, there's no doubt about that, but it is critical. Those who challenge it, of course, challenge it at their peril. There are so many people dependent upon Social Security, especially the elderly component who are you know, often voting. I mean, old, young people don't vote as much as they should, but the old people tend to vote quite a bit, of course. You know. uh, it's really interesting to contemplate, of course, you know, what the pandemic will mean for voting in America. But generally speaking, you know, if you try to challenge uh, the Social Security, uh, you're going to run up against a huge constituent element that's going to see that as a very, very bad thing to do. But Social Security is one of the great reforms of the, I lost my little card there, of the New Deal, um, and indeed, you know, um, something that has a huge impact on the future. And that we, you know, unlike so much of the New Deal, it is somewhat controversial, uh, and yet, you know, uh, the, it continues to have an impact upon us. I'll take a little break here, and I'm going to come back after I get myself set up. <laughs>